All right, so as we're looking at respiration with pH ranges, uh, that's uh, uh, pH range is 0 to 14, and that's acidic to most basic. Uh, the normal uh, pH of a human body is 7.35 to 7.45. This uh, also means that uh, if you're looking at this, a neutral solution would be 7.0. It would be not really acidic and not really alkaline. We sit just a tiny fraction towards the alkaline side. The buffer systems are uh, what we uh, have as a natural defense against acid-base changes in the body. So uh, as you may or may not be aware, uh, we would say like acid out the mouth and base out the butt. And, and that's uh, generally, if we're vomiting, we're gonna lose acidity uh, because a lot of the hydrogen ions are stored in the stomach acid. And then base is where we're losing that bicarb out of the, like a diarrhea, right? Uh, those are uh, particular values that you should probably try to commit to memory because uh, all of the body is trying to basically keep itself in homeostasis, which means that uh, it's trying to keep itself in that range. And if we shift a little bit outside of the range, it can cause catastrophic events later on. Okay, so now we're going to talk about brain structures with uh, respiration and uh, the bigger things that we need to know is the medulla oblongata controls the autonomic functions. Uh, we have two respiratory groups that uh, reside in there and that being the dorsal respiratory group, which is the pacemaker for breathing, and the ventral respiratory group, which is the um, group that allows us to force inspiration and expiration. So if you want to manually increase your uh, ventilation rate, uh, you can do so, uh, unlike your heart rate. Uh, you know, you can't really sit there and tell your heart rate to go to 100, but if you wanted to, we can manually override our respiratory rate and create changes. The PONS dictates when inhalation stops and expiration begins, and this again is all based on that uh, drive, right? So as we're blowing off CO2 and we're uh, taking in uh, oxygen, the uh, body is doing that because of the chemoreceptors in the pons. Uh, regular breathing while at rest and awake is different than when you're at uh, sleep. So, and this again is a voluntary control of the respiratory system versus the intrinsic drive to breathe. So the pons being the uh, basic control center for the respiratory system, uh, if we have trauma to that, we can cause erratic and irregular breathing processes, right? which is where we get the terms chain stokes, ataxic, and then uh, you know the uh, hyperventilation. So there's uh, many different types of breathing patterns that you guys should probably be looking at and trying to kind of kind of commit a pattern to memory, but just remember that most of those are driven by the increasing pressure on the brain stem when we have a traumatic brain injury and it disrupting the respiratory pattern. All right, so when we're talking about uh, ventilation, we have to make sure that we remember some of the basic uh, things that are going on. So we have tidal volume, which is the air moved in a single breath. Uh, and if you don't know, a normal uh, large adult male typically holds about six liters of volume in the lungs. Uh, a typical breath is literally just anywhere from 300 to 600 mLs, uh, depending on uh, how strong their uh, breath was. And so as you can see, there's only about a 10% of the actual lung volume being used in a tidal. The inspiratory reserve volume is the deepest breath you can take after a normal breath. So the expiratory reserve volume is how much you can forcibly breathe out after a normal breath. And I'll let you guys experiment with that. Um, it's really hard to measure without a, a spirometer, but uh, there's a considerable amount of volume left uh, either with the inhalation versus the exhalation, inhalation being stopped by the stretch receptors in the lungs. So if you guys are looking at this, we have uh, a pretty good representation in the pie chart, right? We have inspiratory reserve volume, that's three liters, with a residual volume of 1.2, an expiratory reserve volume of another 1.2, so that's 5.4 with the tidal volume of uh, 500 mLs, right? And so that's uh, 5.9, almost six liters. And again, this is on an average larger male, um, you know, things are going to change with the uh, anatomical structures of different sized people. Uh, it's not a massive shift, but it's enough to be notable. 
Okay, now we're going to get into the circulatory system. Uh, and the circulatory system, as per the slide, is a complex arrangement of connected tubes. And really, we're kind of looking at this as a freeway system uh, where we have main superhighways breaking into smaller roads and until we get into driveways, right? Uh, and, and you have a uh, leaving the core uh, system and then an entering the core system, the arteries being leaving and the venous side being entering. And so uh, we're always trying to funnel that into a uh, more um, streamlined kind of super highway, if you will. Uh, and that's the great vessels. So we have systemic circulation in the body and then the pulmonary circulation in the lungs. Again, I'm gonna stress it one more time. Those colors are flipped in any of the diagrams that you see, so I wanna make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page with that. I don't want anybody to get caught with a blue versus red and not understanding it has to leave the heart to be an artery and it's coming back to the heart to be a vein. So the heart is a muscular organ. It pumps blood throughout the body. It sits uh, behind the sternum. Uh, just shifting a little bit to the left of midline and then it's about the size of your closed fist. So the heart muscle is called your myocardium and the pericardium is that membrane that surrounds the heart uh, and allows it to kind of move and function with uh, its uh, tissue not rubbing and uh, creating friction against the other structures in the body. Uh, looks like we're missing the picture for this particular slide, but there are four chambers to the heart and there's two atria and then two ventricles. Uh, each side of the heart contains one atria and one ventricle. The atria receive blood returned to the heart via the uh, superior and inferior vena cava or the um, pulmonary uh, veins. And then they uh, in turn squeeze uh, pushing blood into the ventricles. Uh, because the atria are really under very low pressure, they're not a very muscular kind of structure, uh, as we'll see shortly. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the valves of the heart. Uh, one of the easiest ways to remember this is TPMA, and that's going to be the uh, blood flow path through the heart so that you can remember where these particular valves are and the tricuspid valve being the valve that separates the right atria from the right ventricle. Uh, this is the uh, blood coming into the heart from the inferior and superior vena cava. It's gonna come into the right atrium, and that valve is keeping that uh, particular uh, area of blood separated from that right ventricle. And then as the right atria squeezes, that blood is gonna go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Uh, then closing, and then we're going to have the pulmonary valve, which is going to, uh, as the right ventricle uh, contracts, is going to open and allow blood flow into the pulmonary system. And as it begins to relax, that particular valve is going to close. The mitral valve then uh, is going to open as the, uh, or I should say, the mitral valve is going to keep the uh, left atrium separated from the left ventricle as it fills and then the left atria squeezes. It is going to push through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then as the uh, left atrium relaxes it's going to close and then the left ventricle is going to actually contract and we're going to push blood through the aortic valve and that is what's supplying the rest of the body and as that left ventricle relaxes that aortic valve then closes so just remember, uh, if you were going from anatomical right, you're gonna go T, and then uh, below that, you're gonna go P, and then you're gonna go to the left upper, and that's M, and then left lower is gonna be A. This is just touching on what I've said about three or four times now in this lecture. Deoxygenated blood returns to the right atria via the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and then freshly oxygenated blood returns to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. Again, try not to confuse the colors on these systems. So the electrical conduction system of the heart, right? And uh, this is really gonna help us out with uh, how the heart is functioning and where these signals are coming so that uh, the heart functions on its own. It's an involuntary contraction. It just does its own thing and these 
uh, this particular structure is designed to function without any external stimulus. So the electrical stimulus uh, controlling the pumping action comes from the sinoatrial node. It then travels down to the AV node, the atrial. It then travels down to the atrial ventricular node or the AV node. Uh, once it makes it through this node, it goes into the bundle of hiss. Uh, and then the right and left bundle branches, and then finally feathering out into the Purkinje fibers. So think of that same thing like with the vessels uh, or the vasculature. This starts out as a nice, thick kind of um, uh, electrical conduction pathway. And when it hits the bundle of his, uh, it's going to be separated into the right and left bundle branches, which is the larger lining of... Uh, um, pathway into the left and the right uh, ventricles and the Purkinje fibers are the very small kind of feathering out uh, small fibers that are pushing the electrical signal out to all the different individual um, cardiac tissue cells. All right so now we're going to talk about the electrical conduction system in the uh, heart uh, and again the Sinoatrial node is in the upper left corner, right? If you're looking at it, that would be the uh, right atrium. And then you can see that it's got a couple of pathways that it's wanting to travel down to get to the AV node, which is gonna be uh, in the lower portion of the right atrium, kind of really sitting at the uh, crossroads between the atria and the ventricles. And then we have that uh, bundle of hiss which is right out of the AV node and then as it comes down you can see where it bifurcates and turns into the AV bundles right so we have the left uh, bundle branch and the right bundle branch and as it kind of feathers out again if you're looking at this it looks very much like a similar structure to vasculature it's going to go into the Purkinje fibers and this is how that electrical signal makes its way to all of the cardiac cells to kind of signal it's time to contract. Again, this is uh, functioning on the autonomic nervous system. There are ho hormones and other uh, controls that can help the rate of contraction, which is chronotropy, the rate of electrical conduction, which is dromotropy, and then the strength of the contraction, which is inotropy. And as you can see, it says chronotropic, dromotropic, and the inotropic uh, state. Baroreceptors uh, respond into those changes of pressure and then the chemo receptors changes in chemical composition of blood right and so uh, a good way for you to think about baroreceptors is if you ever uh, stood up or sat up really quickly and you got lightheaded for a second the uh, initial change for that is the baroreceptors responding to a decrease in blood flow to the brain which would make the vasculature want to close down and increase pressure uh, chemo receptors are a little bit more sensitive and there's a lot more involved in that uh, and it has more to do with the pH and other things that are in the blood signifying uh, by hormones and stuff like that that uh, we need to increase pressure or decrease pressure. Okay so the cardiac cycle is uh, the process of the pumping of the heart right and so we have systole which is the contraction of the ventricular mass uh, which causes blood to be pumped into the uh, body's systemic circulation, and then diastole, which is a relaxation phase. And this is where we get uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, right? So systolic blood pressure being uh, at the peak of pressure from when the heart is in its contraction phase, and the diastole is the uh, lowest pressure that we're sensing uh, overall average for when the heart is in its relaxed phase. Uh, afterload is defined by the pressure in the aorta, which the left ventricle pumps against, right? So uh, this is the overall kind of average of pressure between systolic and diastolic pressure. And this is really what the, what the heart is going to be pushing against. So uh, people with, say, CHF or things like that are really struggling to push against this afterload, which is the systemic vascular pressure. Uh, stroke volume is the amount of blood that is pushed out of the heart or ejected uh, per contraction, right? Uh, and you can call that uh, ejection fraction, which is a, a little bit more complex uh, way of looking at what uh, stroke volume is. Um, just 
take in note that a perfect ejection fraction, which is you know the uh, stroke volume of the left ventricle, is typically between 55 and 60 percent. It's not 100 uh, percent. It's impossible for the heart to push every last remaining blood cell out of the left ventricle uh, with each contraction. Cardiac output is a simple math formula of that stroke volume by how much heart rate uh, in one minute. Right? And so that would tell you uh, where you're at in regards to uh, how quickly we're cycling through blood. Now when we're talking about the vascular system, we're looking at arteries carrying blood away from the heart and veins carrying it back to the heart. Arteries branching into arterioles and then arterioles turning into capillaries capillaries being connected back to the venules and then venules coming back into the veins, which then again, if we're really looking at this, you have the aorta and the vena cava as the great vessels where everything is coming to and from the core. Okay, so now we're looking at the circulation of the heart and this is supplied by the right and left coronary arteries. And again, these arteries are supplied first before the rest of the body so that the heart can get uh, nutrition and oxygen uh, first because it's going to have a constant state of demand. The pulmonary circulation, uh, again, uh, we have blood that leaves the heart and goes to the lungs and then comes back to the heart on the left side. And then uh, that is going to leave the heart and go back into the systemic circulation being oxygenated. So systemic arterial circulation, which is oxygenated blood leaving the heart into the aorta. The aorta uh, is the superhighway delivering freshly oxygenated blood to the uh, body. And uh, as it breaks into smaller sections, that's where it's gonna go from aorta to uh, arterioles and then into capillaries. And then the venous return is the deoxygenated and uh, often the, the waste and byproducts leaving the cells and coming back through the veins, uh, you know, through its filtration system and then it's uh, gonna come back up to the heart to be reoxygenated. Okay, so here's a uh, picture with some uh, the, of the uh, venous structures of the uh, head and neck. Uh, we can see the EJ, which is uh, the external jugular, and that is the only, uh, what we wanna call a uh, core uh, or central line in the field, right, uh, is an EJ. So just remember if you see that question and it says what is the uh, central line available to the intermediate and above uh, EMS provider, that is gonna be the external jugular. Uh, we're never really kind of trying to dive for that internal jugular. It's uh, pretty deep and protected by musculature in the neck and we don't wanna start poking around in there. So as that internal jugular comes down, you can see the subclavian vein, which runs up through the uh, um, shoulder and then that's gonna actually completely dump into the brachiocephalic vein, which is gonna turn into the in, uh, superior vena cava. Uh, you can see all of these uh, veins throughout the hand and up into the arm. And uh, then as we look uh, to the right, you see the hepatic portal system. And this is where a lot of the waste products are kind of filtered out of the bloodstream, uh, leaving the intestines and uh, other uh, internal organs and uh, the uh, liver and the kidneys again being some of the uh, um, organs that are cleaning up the blood supply as it goes back up to the heart. Uh, again, if we're looking at those uh, great vessels in the leg, you can see that inferior vena cava coming off of the uh, femoral vein. Um, that is gonna be a more superficial, right? We're always gonna remember that the uh, arterial sides are gonna be protected by more muscle and bone than the uh, vein, and that's due to pressure and the overwhelming uh, ability to kind of uh, suffer really significant blood loss if we have any kind of a failure of the uh, arterial side. Now, when we're talking about blood, we're talking about uh, it consisting of plasma and other formed elements, right? Those are the red blood cells, white blood cells, and things like that that are suspended in the plasma. Red blood cells carrying oxygen to tissues. Uh, red blood cells are uh, typically red because they're oxygenated. That is the uh, actual oxide in the iron that sits in the uh, red blood cell causing that kind of red coloration, right? That rusty red color. Uh, we also carry hemoglobin, uh, which is a protein carrying oxygen by itself. Uh, it's bound to it. Antigens on the surface of the red blood cells determine, 
determine your uh, blood group type, right? So that's A, B, and O, and then that's uh, positive or negative, right? So RH, which is rhesus positive or uh, uh, without the RH, uh, that would be negative. White blood cells called leukocytes fight infection, and there are several different varieties. And then the platelets are in the blood to help form blood clots. Okay, so the simple uh, idea here is a pulse is created by blood pumping out of the left ventricle into the major arteries. And then uh, the blood pressure is that uh, pressure exerted against artery walls in the uh, um, systolic, uh, I guess, peak event. Uh, and then the sphagmometer measures your high and low points, which is what's gonna give us our systolic versus our diastolic uh, points in a blood pressure. Okay, so this is saying that the adult uh, has an average of about five liters of blood. Uh, infants is about 300 mLs, which is really not a lot. And then children, two to three liters. Uh, this is pulse points for central and peripheral pulses. And this is where it can be felt against the uh, most exposed po points of the body. So again, think about these arteries for the most part are gonna be deep within uh, muscle bellies, uh, long, long bones. And uh, every time that they have to come past a joint or something significant like that on a structure, they're gonna run a little superficial and that's where our pulse points are. So if you're looking, you have the carotid, the brachial, and the radial, you can actually get a pulse on the ulnar side. It's really difficult in my experience. And then we have the femoral pulse and then uh, the posterior tibial, which is kind of right there at the heel. And then you have the dorsal, which is your pedal pulse. So your uh, circulatory system should adjust and uh, kind of react automatically, right? And that, again, goes back to that chemo and barrel receptors. And perfusion is the circulation, uh, by definition, is the circulation of blood to an organ or tissue in adequate amounts, right? So uh, when we're in shock, the uh, overwhelming easy way to look at that is inadequate tissue perfusion, right? So there's a very necessary amount of oxygen and glucose that needs to be delivered to the cells. And then we need to get the waste products away from those cells and then uh, out excreted out of the body. All right, so inadequate circulation in adults, the heart will automatically adjust to lower blood volume as the patient loses blood was it's going to attempt to create the same amount of perfusion, right? This is an involuntary measure and the heart will uh, increase its rate and attempt to increase its uh, pressure by contracting harder in the initial stages of shock. And then as, pressure, uh, as that pressure continues to fall, we'll go into that decompensated shock where the heart is no longer able to override the system's lack of perfusion. Okay, so now we're looking at the functions of blood and hydrostatic pressure moving plasma and nutrients from the capillaries into the interstitial space. So if you're looking at the picture, right, we have the capillary there and this is where that gas exchange is taking place. So uh, because everything wants to, to balance, you can see that uh, as oxygen is perhaps uh, rich inside the uh, bloodstream and the cells and tissue are not rich with oxygen, they're gonna kind of cross over each other and create that balance. Uh, and then again, the cells are excreting wastes into the bloodstream. And then uh, the bloodstream uh, or red blood cells and plasma are uh, putting nutrition or uh, glucose back into the cells. All right, now we're looking at the lymphatic system. This uh, lymphatic system helps absorb fat from the digestive tract. It's gonna help maintain fluid balance, right? This is where some of the uh, fluids are not actually in the vascular system per se. It's not in the uh, venous system. And uh, a lot of the uh, ability to fight infection lives in the lymphatic tissue. Uh, and so it's uh, transporting that lymph by passive circulation. So this is like, kind of involuntary, it's because uh, of your movement, right? So as you move your extremities or other muscles, those muscles push on the lymph system, which creates enough pressure to move that uh, fluid throughout the body. Lymph nodes are interspersed along the courses of the lymph vessels, and then the lymph vessels absorb excess fluid and return it to the central uh, venous circulation. Uh, and so 
oncotic pressure is not enough by itself to move all the interstitial back into the vasculature system. So that oncotic is just that static pressure. Uh, and again, we're using the body to kind of create that movement of fluid throughout the lymphatic system.